Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. We need voices. We need people with experience. And they said, well, who? And I said, can you get that young Miller kid who was with George Schultz and James Baker just a few years ago, <laughs> like Aaron David Miller 30 years ago, joining us now, uh, a, a bit wiser, a bit older, Aaron David Miller out of Tulane and, of course, definitive at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I want you to tell me how the facts <laughs> changed, Aaron David Miller. If I go directly west of Jerusalem, almost to the Mediterranean, to, I think it's Janeiro, I don't have it in front of me, a little village, 30,000 people, directly south of Tel Aviv, where a missile took out a school in the dead of night. No one was hurt. But how does that missile, Aaron David Miller, landing on that school in a small town, how does that change the dialogue? Yeah, uh, it, it, yeah it's a town of Kadera, and uh, whether that was a, a, a strike or, or shrapnel from an <clears throat> interceptor is unclear. But look, I think there are two things here. And, and by the way, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the, uh, the kudos. Um, number one, um, what, what happened yesterday is virtually unprecedented, um, certainly in, in the Arab-Israeli, Iranian-Israeli uh, conflict. Iran launched 180 plus ballistic missiles, and unlike cruise missiles, this these take only 12 minutes, roughly, to travel from Iran to impact in Israeli airspace. Um, and um, it was a saturation attack. It covered much of the country. Yes, it was directed primarily at several military bases and Mossad headquarters. But I've been to Mossad headquarters. It is not in some isolated area. Um, so it this could have been, uh, to say the least. A catastrophe, and yet Israel's uh, air layer defense, um, Iron Dome, David Sling Arrow, uh, managed to intercept most. The U.S. two destroyers right. shot down uh, a dozen or so. The Jordanians contributed as well, um, and and I think that's the good news that Iran may have three thousand ballistic missiles, but it took a huge shot yesterday, and it essentially failed. At the same time, this is the second direct attack uh, from Iran on Israel. The other right. one was April 13, 14. The Israelis are, are going to respond. Um, I, I don't think there's any doubt. They cannot allow a, quote, new normal to be created. And even while they're degrading to a, Hezbollah to a point where it is a, a hollowed out shadow of, of itself, um, they're, they're right. going to respond. They're going to respond. Biden's going to talk to uh, to Netanyahu shortly before the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, which starts. OK, Aaron, just because of time, because I know Paul wants to get in. I got one more question. Paul's got a bunch of important questions. Robert D. Kaplan, Aaron, David Miller would say, get out the map from Armenia down to the tip of the Persian Gulf is 500 miles, and then it's another 500 miles, 1,000 miles total across from Dubai. That's the western border of Iran. Where should Israel attack? Well, I think the strikes will be multiple. I think there, there'll be uh, economic targets. There'll be strategic conventional uh, military facilities. There'll be uh, IRGC command and control facilities. The nuclear sites, I'm sure there's an argument being made uh, that now is the time. Hezbollah is weakened and no longer has the deterrent capacity. Hamas is organized military structure is gone. Iran's defenses are weak. So do it now. Um, right. I, I'm taking a flyer here, but I, I think the Israelis this time around will avoid non Nantaz and the enrichment facilities. Okay. Because, I mean, Aaron, I think a lot of folks just were, were coming up to the one year anniversary of the October 7th uh, attack here and the, and the scope of and the aims of this response from Israel have gone from 
decapitating Hamas and getting the hostages back to something much, much broader in the region. And as you suggest, perhaps the thinking is, if not now, when do we deal a really severe blow to Iran? What are the chances of that in terms of the nuclear facilities, do you think? You know, I think the, an argument can be made. U.S. elections coming. The Israelis have more margin for maneuver, maneuver uh, and, and operational capacity now. They probably will never have a more propitious moment. The question is whether or not uh, this would be coordinated with the United States. Again, I'm I'm assuming they'll be the Iranians are going to respond to whatever the Israelis do, most likely. There may be ample opportunities, but again, I'm thinking opportunity or not, the Israelis can set the program back. They do not have the capacity to fundamentally destroy it and permanently um, prevent its uh, its rebuilding. And remember, Iran is a uh, nuclear right. weapons threshold state. They, they don't yet have a right. nuclear weapon. And I think that has Aaron, to be taken into the mix. Aaron, I've got to get this in with great respect to your public service back 30 years ago. What would Yitzhak Rabin say right now? Rabin would not have handled October 7th the way this current Israeli government would have handled it. Rabin would have responded probably as forcefully. But during the course of that conflict, uh, this man, who had a sense of strategy, uh, understood the relationship between the application of military force and achievable political endgames. Rabin would have understood that Israel is involved in three wars of attrition, one with Hamas, one with Hezbollah, and obviously one with Iran. And I think he would have begun to understand and to work with, rather not rather than not against, the United States and other regional allies, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Saudis, on trying to figure out a way to create an alternative to Hamas in Gaza uh and an alternative political reality over time in lebanon that's the difference i think between this israeli prime minister on trial for bribery fraud and breach of trust in a jerusalem district court whose uh, entire world is driven largely um, by his political future or the absence of one if she if he should be convicted and have to cut a plea deal uh, right. to avoid prison time that's the difference this has been wonderful. Aaron David Miller, thank you for your contribution uh, with Carnegie. There's no other uh, way to put it. His wonderful book years ago out as well, The Much Too Promised uh, Land. Aaron David uh, Miller. With us now is someone who runs some money in charge of all the dividend complex at Federated Pittsburgh and also an author. I've said a lot about the immense intellectual challenge of Daniel Paris's The Ownership Dividend. It is a dense, short read on what's really interesting about how equity stocks became, and this is a quote from the book, U.S. stocks began moving in the direction of becoming nearly cashless investments. Wonderful to have you here. You mentioned buybacks. Maybe we've reached a peak. Can Apple just keep buying back stock mathematically? Why can't they just keep giving profits buying back stock? Uh, thank you for having me on the show, Tom and, and Paul. Uh, you know, I, I would dispute the notion that they're buying back, that they're giving uh, profits back to shareholders. I, I take a different view of buybacks. But right now, buybacks are very, very popular. They're going to continue to do it. I think their last uh, uh, authorization was $100 billion. Uh, it's a stunning amount of money. We're heading towards a trillion dollars in buybacks this year uh, in uh, fiscal or calendar 2024. Dividends from the S&P 500 will be about 600, 620 or so, 625. So buybacks are, are are just wildly acceptable. Uh, from a shareholder perspective, though, a business owner perspective, investing through the stock market, buybacks don't really work. Uh, Why for you us. end up with fewer shares? If work. you if you do now, most companies announce sharebacks very loudly, uh, but the amount of uh, the share capital that they take out of circulation is always lower because they're issuing short sure. shares out the back door. And their timing of buybacks, you know, the market's yeah. at an all time high. Uh, the timing of buybacks is generally fairly poor. Companies initiate buybacks when they uh, are flush with cash. Uh, it would be better if they did it when they were in the swale of their cycle, not at the peak. 
peak. Uh, so there are lots of reasons why the blackboard math of buybacks, which in the academy is neutral to a dividend. I right. write books and books and books on why that's not the case, but why that's just not the case you know, I, in, in the market. I got to bring in our guest here because we go into a 3 a.m. meeting on Bloomberg Surveillance, and Sweeney's like a robot. Get Parasun, get Parasun, exactly. get Parasun. <laughs> Paul, this is your guest. Exactly. Hey, Dan, I mean, I, you know, when I was a research analyst on Wall Street, you know, I had my income model, I had my balance sheet model, but by far the most important model for me was my cash flow model. Indeed. I wanted to know where the cash was coming from and where it's going. So when you sit down with a management team, do you have a preferred strategy of, hey, you've got X dollars of free cash flow every year. We think this much should go to buyback, this much should go to dividends. Do you have a, a policy you like to talk to management teams about? We are not in the interest of starving companies of capital. That is the number one accusation made against business owners in the stock market, minority business owners in the stock market seeking a cash payment for their capital. It is not that we're trying to bankrupt these companies, but there is a reasonable allocation. For the U.S. stock market for decades, the U.S. economy for decades, indeed, better part of two centuries, was able to grow very, very rapidly and have a dividend payout ratio of approximately 50 okay. percent. So we're able to build an industrial uh, juggernaut and still pay out cash dividends. Now you have tech companies and others saying, oh, if I, if I pay a dividend, I won't be able to grow. The fact is they're using the money for other purposes. I, I, but I would say that you know we've been around a third for a while, okay. for the last decade or two. I think the more appropriate level for a business owner approaching the stock market as an opportunity to own businesses over the long term is something closer to about half. And that's free cash flow. As you yes. know, the earnings payout of, of nominal book earnings at this point is so polluted with the accounting uh, challenges and uh, the shenanigans of adjusted EPS and so forth that we really look at um, uh, free cash flow. So for, you know, our stock market has been for a couple of decades at least, driven almost entirely by big technology companies, uh, even more so over the last few years. They'll give you a token dividend, Apple, Meta, you know, less than 1%. What do you say to those management teams who have literally almost countless free cash flow every single year? Yeah, and so this year we saw a couple companies move in that direction, symbolically, token, yeah. no, no more than that. So I don't want to uh, discourage that that behavior, but they're not part of the dividend universe yet because the cash flows simply aren't there to the to the minority shareholder. Uh, so we we like the movement in that direction, but it's not material yet. And so it's a journey, uh, not a moment. It would be stunning if one of those large companies were to announce a dividend payment that amounted to three or four percent of their share price uh, of their uh, market capitalization and announced that they were backing off of the buybacks. But that that would get our right. attention. Discuss well, yeah. Duke Energy. <laughs> Good morning, Tim Cook. I know you're listening on your commute today out in Cupertino. Duke Energy with a 3.6% yield, their persistency of excellence over 20 years is jaw-dropping, coming out to about a 10% return. But their five-year dividend growth is 2.02%. Which matters more, the yield or the dividend growth? I'm not going to discuss individual securities, but I will answer the, the question. When you operate with a high yield, the hard part is dividend growth. So we, uh, the U.S. stock market has a yield of around 1.3%. We target in our portfolios a yield, gross yield between 4 and 5%. Mm. Uh, Duke meets that standard. Other companies do as well. At that level, the hard part is dividend growth. Where we spend almost all of our time is trying to figure out those companies that do have a reasonable cash flow payout, are they in a position to grow uh, better? Uh, you ask about utilities in general, they have been among the less rapidly growing dividend companies over the last couple decades. However, watch out over the next couple decades. The demand for electricity has finally stopped being flatlined. It yeah. has kicked up, and these companies are well positioned to uh, benefit from that. Okay, so Total of Paris. I mean, I, I don't want you to go into the individual stock, Paul, but I got a 5.1% yield and a dividend growth like Duke Energy of 3.5%. When do you know you're a yield hog or a dividend hog 
versus doing something intelligent like Paul does in his 501k. So Total has its enter, its analyst day uh, today in New York. I'm heading to that right after uh, ah. we sign off. And so uh, we will find out what they're announcing. But they, they do, uh, that company, can't discuss individual securities, but I can say yeah. the numbers that you presented have a, a reasonably good balance of uh, dividend yield and dividend growth. Right. Uh, but your question again, where the risk of being a dividend investor in a stock market is exactly what you identified, Tom, and that is the risk of being too yieldy and not enough dividend growth. And that's what we work on sort of every day in the portfolio. So, so what is that balance for you? I mean, uh, for us, it's roughly 50-50, meaning okay. we are looking for an even 4 to 5% uh, yield on, at the portfolio level, not individual securities, and roughly the same in dividend growth. Okay. And the harder part, I will tell you, in a 1.5% yielding market, which is all oriented towards buybacks and, and flashy, uh, shiny new objects, mm -hmm. the hard part's the dividend growth, and that's where we spend most of our time. Dan Paris, thank you so much. Great to have you in our studios here from Pittsburgh, best baseball park in America. No question about that with the Pirates. The book is The Ownership Dividend, as he manages the dividend portfolio at Federated. Daniel Paris, thanks so much for being with us this morning. With the tensions of the world, maybe a little bit of earnings as well, Nike and Humana, very difficult this morning. Futures negative 10 Dow, futures negative 141. The VIX out over 20, 19.45 right now on the VIX. Paul Sweeney's yield, the two-year yield, 3.61%, uh, higher yields, 3.76%. Uh, we had a 399 30-year, now 4.11, so a higher set of yields across a full faith and credit curve. On oil, Brent crude up 2.8%, up a full $2. It's gone negative two standard deviations out to plus two standard deviations eloquently. It's 75.60. There was a debate last night. Did there you was. watch any of it? I did not, but I got the highlights this morning. Much like you would go to ESPN for sports highlights, I went to get some of those highlights. Yeah. It, it, it seemed pretty reasonable they yes. acted like reasonable adults there's some policy they acted discussion. like ed mills they were polite exactly. cordial <laughs> deferential joining us now the polite cordial deferential ed mills policy analyst at raymond james i was thunderstruck ed mills by the decorum almost to the edge of kennedy nixon just a few years ago ed before your time is that where we're going in five years when all of this anger recedes Tom, I hope so. Um, you know, I, I was struck and I have uh, folks on my team who are kind of somewhat newer, kind of I don't go back to Kennedy Nixon, but I've been watching uh, for my adult life the all of the debates. Um, and it's been remarkable. You go back to 2016, you go back to 2020, and it seems like this is the conversation we had. The more substantive debate was at the vice presidential level. Um, and when you turn on the commentary afterwards, um, there is a lot of conversation of, um, would the American people prefer these as their candidates? Um, I do think it's uh, nice to actually have a debate where you have candidates turn to each other and say, I actually agree with what you said, but here's my vision. Um, and, and we ha had that multiple times last night. So, Ed, I mean, I, I, the reality is vice presidential debates have little uh, impact generally on the broader general election. As we make this sprint here towards November 5th, what is the goal of each campaign, do you think? Yeah, Paul, I think that that's absolutely correct. I, what we wrote in our note at Raymond James was the goal of a vice presidential candidate is to get the American people to have comfort with him or her um, on whether or not they could be president. Um, and I think both of those candidates clearly um, cleared that bar last night. Um, as we look to your question and what the sprint is to um, the end of the the month here into November 5th is trying to get momentum back for the Trump Vance team and trying to maintain the momentum uh, for the Harris Walls team. Uh, and I continue to believe we have seven swing states, um, but as I do my maps, it's very hard to see one side winning unless they capture Pennsylvania. Uh, so it's going to be essentially all four of those candidates uh, should take up residency either in Philadelphia or in Pittsburgh and see what they can get out of that state uh, to see who can win this election. So, Ed, I mean, you know, 
Tom and I, by, by our math, we think there's 42 people maybe in the state of Pennsylvania that are going to decide this election. I, I just don't recall it ever being so tight. Um, what, it seems like a new world of campaigning, a new world of politics, seemingly it gets tighter and tighter. What, in fact, can be done between now and November 5th by either side? Um, well, I think it's a important question because we do have uh, the fact that we are just started the month of October uh, and we have a list of potential October surprises. So uh, for Harris, I think it is about trying to contain those surprises, uh, trying to contain some of the momentum that she's had since she's announced as a candidate. Uh, and for Trump, what we're watching is back in 2016 and 2020, he had a surge at the end. Is he able to capitalize yeah, yeah. On, on this and, and, and get that surge once again? Yeah, Amy Walter's note out at Cook Political Report Ed, this morning is jaw dropping on the closeness of this and the dynamics here. She takes undecided in swing states from 10 percent down to 5 percent. Ed Mills, 2020 NPR, quote, just 44,000 votes in Georgia, Arizona and Wisconsin separated Biden and Trump from a tie in the Electoral College. Are we closer now? Uh, potentially. And I look at that and I say, if it does come down to Pennsylvania, uh, Tom, uh, there's a law in Pennsylvania that does not allow you to open up uh, ballots that have been mailed in until 7 p.m. on election night. Um, and so it's very possible that we would have the repeat of 2020 in Pennsylvania where same day votes favor Trump you have an election, if it hinges on Pennsylvania, what I am concerned for from a market perspective, from a voters and, and the American people accepting the outcome of this election is I don't want right. it to come down to one state and have that lead dwindle as kind of votes get um, counted and, right. and then a, a doubt set in. And a, a civics question with your expertise here and, and folks, Ed Mills for decades, legislative experience and of course his work at Raymond James. When someone says to you, mail order votes are shady, uncountable, whatever other language you want to do, how do you respond to that? Um, I point to the literature that shows that they are incredibly um, kind of safe and easy way of doing it. Um, we have a couple of states, um, Utah, Washington state, that kind of almost exclusively uh, vote by mail. When I started in campaigns, um, it was the exact opposite. It was disproportionately Democrats that showed up on the, the same day. And uh, a lot of conversations was how do we shift that kind of uh, politically one way or another, uh, depending upon which side you're working on. Uh, so, so it's pretty remarkable. It's only in recent years where you've had those concerns uh, pop up into our conversation. Ed, what should we be looking for down ballot uh, for each of these parties here? Are there certain states, certain seats that you're focusing on? Yeah, so in the House of Representatives, I think the the switch from Biden to Harris has probably had the biggest impact. Uh, something I'm looking at there is that Democrats need to pick up about you know, three or four seats in, in the House of Representatives uh, to win the majority. There are eight Republicans in New York and California who are labeled as toss ups. And so to the extent that the Democratic base has been energized right. since Harris has gotten into this election, uh, right. those Republicans have a tougher um, kind of road ahead for them. Uh, on the Senate side, you right. look at the fact that uh, Tester in Montana probably could decide who has a majority uh, in the Senate right. uh, and Tester's underwater. Um, so Democrats have moved into Texas, moved into Florida. Uh, the question there is, is that a recognition of right. uh, they are very much underwater right. in their attempt to keep the majority. And I got 30 seconds. John from just east of Newark, New Jersey, asks, is the salt tax going to get fixed? Um, <laughs> if Democrats win, I think the salt tax expires and resets to being unlimited. I think that there is a Republican sweep. It stays as if, as is. If Republicans win, but there is a Democratic House, look for a compromise at $20,000 versus $10,000 and an income threshold of $500,000. Uh, to qualify for that higher twenty thousand uh, dollar tax deduction, John, thanks you for that response. Well, Ed Mills, brilliant with Raymond James. You know how much I hate the Fed parlor game, <laughs> except Paul. This time is different. You got to look at the parlor game. Stephanie Roth with a brilliant note. 
at Wolf Research, really frames it out, the many different opinions. Stephanie, critically, you say the three-month trend is not 116,000, 116,000 is published, but is a higher statistic. Why is that? Many disagree with you. Totally fair. So when you look at the three-month average as it's been reported, sure, that it's 116,000. But what we've seen historically is that August tends to get revised up. So by actually up to 49,000 by the third print. So if you incorporate those types of revisions, which we expect to see uh, on Friday, and of course, we'll see whether that's that's right or not. But if we get a 49,000 upward revision to the month of August, then your three-month right. trend is closer to 135. And what's amazing about this, folks, one yep. over the square root of N, <laughs> is you got Bucknell Mathematics here, oh, boy. along with Masters in Statistics from Who Columbia University. Like the other day, we're talking to Sebastian Page about Gaussian and Poisson distribution. <laughs> Stephanie's all over that. She's all a Masters in Statistics. Oh, my goodness. So, Stephanie, people are telling me I really have to pay attention to this labor report this coming Friday. Is that because the Fed's really focused on that? Yeah, this is this is the most important payrolls report of the year. Wow. For a couple of reasons. One, this is we're now starting to get concerned about the labor market. We have seen a deceleration in in, in momentum in terms of of jobs and Powell said this. It's not about the level of the labor market, but it is about the speed. And the next couple of prints are going to be really noisy outside of this one. So once we get the, the October print printed in November, we're going to have the impact of Boeing strikes, potentially. We're going to have the potential impact of port strikes. We're going to have the hurricane. And that could last for a couple of months. So this is one of the cleanest reads we're going to get in a, in a, in a point where the labor market is the, the most important thing here. So stepping back from that, I mean, how how do you kind of view this labor market? Um, again, some people are saying, hey, if you look at the absolute levels, it's in good shape, 4.2%, whatever the unemployment rate. That's kind of full employment. But are there are others saying, boy, the most recent trends are troubling. How do you kind of view it? Yeah, and the recent trends certainly point to a deceleration. And this is kind of what a soft landing looks like, right? At some point, soft landing and recession look kind of similar because you get that deceleration. And the question is where you stabilize. So what we're seeing right now is the, the labor market is, is, is fairly healthy. Claims are, are not picking up. We're seeing... Um, job openings even yesterday, that kind of stabilized. So our base case is that the labor market is going to stabilize at a level that's similar to what we saw in 2019, which is a healthy labor market. One reason to believe that is uh, forgetting about the labor market data, but if you look at consumer spending, that remains really healthy. It's running at about a 3% real realized pace, which, which, is, which is better than most folks would have expected, especially if you're concerned right. about the labor market. This is just another economic data point that tells you that the economy is right. really doing just fine. Stephanie, Goldman Sachs came out with, I believe, a 3.2% run rate statistic on real GDP, which dovetails with your optimism on the labor economy. Do we still have a, a legitimate real wage? Yeah, we, well, yeah, we do. Um, we, we, we certainly do. And that's one reason why the consumer is still able to, to be spending. And now that you have inflation slowing back down, you know, pretty considerably, now your, 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 your wages are, 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 your real wages are at least in positive territory, which is, which is a, a good thing. For a period of time, that wasn't the case because inflation was running so high. But now your inflation rate is running at or even below 2% if you look on a, on a six-month basis. So consumers are actually able to, to be in a better position. And then we didn't even talk about interest rates, which are, are now starting to, to come down. So you're having an easing in financial conditions at a point where inflation is now running back down towards 2%. So that's a that's a good impetus for 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 the consumer. So let's step back and, and what is your view of the consumer? We've had a lot of the companies kind of calling out the lower end of the consumers, really struggling here. Whether you look at the numbers out of a Walmart or a Target or the dollar stores, how do you view the consumer here? The consumer's okay, and that's been the case for a while. We've had for the past year and a half, we've heard heard companies come out and talk about the decelerating lower end consumer, and that is that has absolutely been the case. There has been a divergence between the middle and higher end consumer versus the lower end. But now there's a good reason to believe that actually that lower end consumer could start to do a little bit better. Their credit card interest rates are going to be coming down. And, you know, the, it turns out the savings for the broad based economy is actually a bit better than what was previously reported. Right. We just got GDP revisions last week that told us that the savings rate is closer to 5% rather than 3%. So the, the consumer actually has a bit more buffer than we previously thought. And Powell talked about this um, the other day, highlighting exactly the, the, the same concept that, you know, now maybe maybe the consumer is a bit healthier than we thought. 
So, so yeah, you, you know, you right. might still hear a little bit of softness on the lower end, but uh, we should actually start to see an inflection point where things get a bit better for the consumer. Hugely valuable, folks. This is what it's all about, the distinction of our conversations on Bloomberg surveillance. Stephanie Roth, they're pushing against uh, the caution on the American labor economy. Stephanie Roth is with Wolf. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.